Air France Flight 447 AF447 AFR447 was a scheduled international passenger flight from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, to Paris, France, which crashed on the 1st of June 2009. The Airbus A330, operated by Air France, stalled and did not recover, eventually crashing into the Atlantic Ocean at 2:14 coordinated universal time, killing all 228 passengers and crew on board. The Brazilian Navy removed the first major wreckage and two bodies from the sea within five days of the accident, but the initial investigation by France's Bureau d'Enquites et d'Analyses pour la Sécurité de l'Aviation Civile B, was hampered because the aircraft's flight recorders were not recovered from the ocean floor until May 2011, nearly two years later. The B's final report, released at a news conference on 5 July 2012, concluded that the aircraft crashed after temporary inconsistencies between the airspeed measurements, likely due to the aircraft's pitted tubes being obstructed by ice crystals, caused the autopilot to disconnect, after which the crew reacted incorrectly and ultimately caused the aircraft to enter an aerodynamic stall, from which it did not recover. The accident is the deadliest in the history of Air France, as well as the deadliest aviation accident involving the Airbus A330. Topic: Aircraft. The aircraft involved in the accident was an Airbus A330-203, with manufacturer serial number 660, registered as FGZCP. Its first flight was on 25 February 2005, and was delivered two months later to the airline on 18 April 2005. At the time of the crash, it was Air France's latest A330. The aircraft was powered by two General Electric CF6-80E1A3 engines with a maximum thrust of 68,530-60,400ths of a pound, takeoff, max continuous, giving it a cruise speed range of Mach 0.82 to 0.86, 871-913 km per hour, 470-493 knots, 540-566 miles per hour, at 35,000 feet, 10.7 km altitude and a range of 12,500 km 6,750 nmi, 7,760 statute miles. On 17 August 2006, this A330 was involved in a ground collision with Airbus A321-211 FGTAM, at Charles de Gaulle Airport, Paris. FGTAM was substantially damaged while FGZCP suffered only minor damage. The aircraft underwent a major overhaul on 16 April 2009, and at the time of the accident had accumulated about 18,870 flying hours. Topic. Passengers and crew The aircraft was carrying 216 passengers, three aircrew and nine cabin crew in two cabins of service. Among the 216 passengers were 126 men, 82 women and eight children, including one infant. There were three pilots in the aircrew. The captain, 58-year-old Marc Dubois, PNF pilot not flying, had joined Air France at the time, Air Inter, in February 1988 and had 10,988 flying hours, of which 6,258 were as captain, including 1,700 hours on the Airbus A330, had carried out 16 rotations in the South America sector since he arrived in the A330, A340 division in 2007. The first officer, co-pilot in left seat, 37-year-old David Robert, PNF pilot not flying, had joined Air France in July 1998 and had 6,547 flying hours, of which 4,479 hours were on the Airbus A330, had carried out 39 rotations in the South America sector since he arrived in the A330, A340 division in 2002. Robert had graduated from École Nationale de l'Aviation Civile ENAC, one of the elite Grandes Écoles, and had transitioned from a pilot to a management job at the airline's operations center. He served as a pilot on this flight in order to maintain his flying credentials. 
The first officer, co-pilot in right seat, 32-year-old Pierre Cédric Bonin PF pilot flying, had joined Air France in October 2003 and had 2,936 flight hours, of which 807 hours were on the Airbus A330, had carried out five rotations in the South America sector since arriving in the A330, A340 division in 2008. Of the 12 crew members, including aircrew and cabin crew, 11 were French and one was Brazilian. The majority of passengers were French, Brazilian, or German citizens. The passengers included business and holiday travelers. Air France had gathered approximately 60 to 70 relatives and friends who arrived at Charles de Gaulle Airport to pick up arriving passengers. Many of the passengers on Flight 447 were connecting to other destinations worldwide, so other parties anticipating the arrival of passengers were instead to appear at various other airports that were the passengers' final destinations. On 20 June 2009, Air France announced that each victim's family would be paid roughly €17,500 in initial compensation. Topic. Notable passengers Prince Pedro Luis of Orléans Braganca, third in succession to the abolished throne of Brazil. He had dual Brazilian-Belgian citizenship. He was returning home to Luxembourg from a visit to his relatives in Rio de Janeiro. Silvio Barbato, composer and former conductor of the symphony orchestras of the Claudio Santoro National Theater in Brasilia and the Rio de Janeiro Municipal Theater, he was en route to Kiev for engagements there. Fatma Karen Nesipolu, Turkish classical harpist and academic of Anadolu University in Eskishahir, she was returning home via Paris after performing at the 4th Rio Harp Festival. Pablo Dreyfus from Argentina, a campaigner for controlling illegal arms and the illegal drugs trade. Topic. Accident The aircraft departed from Rio de Janeiro Galileo International Airport on 31 May 2009 at 19.29 Brazilian Standard Time, 22.29 Coordinated Universal Time, with a scheduled arrival at Paris Charles de Gaulle Airport at 11.03, 9.03 Coordinated Universal Time the following day, estimated flight time of 10.34. Voice contact with the aircraft was lost around 1.35 Coordinated Universal Time, 3 hours and 6 minutes after the 22.29 Coordinated Universal Time departure. The last message reported the aircraft had passed waypoint INTOL 1 degree 21 minutes 39 seconds south 32 degrees 49 minutes 53 seconds west, located 565 kilometers 351 miles off Natal, on Brazil's northeastern coast. The aircraft left Brazilian Atlantic radar surveillance at 1:49 Coordinated Universal Time and entered a communication dead zone. The Airbus A330 is designed to be flown by a crew of two pilots. However, the 13-hour duty time, flight duration plus pre-flight preparation required for the Rio Paris route exceeds the 10 hours permitted before a pilot must take a break dictated by Air France's procedures. To comply with these procedures, Flight 447 was crewed by three pilots, a captain and two first officers. With three pilots on board, each can take a break in the A330's rest cabin which is situated behind the cockpit. In accordance with common practice, Captain Dubois had sent one of the co-pilots for the first rest period with the intention of taking the second break himself. At 1.55 Coordinated Universal Time, he woke First Officer Robert and said, He's going to take my place. After having attended the briefing between the two co-pilots, the captain left the cockpit to rest at 2 hours 1 minute and 46 seconds Coordinated Universal Time. At 2.06 Coordinated Universal Time, the pilot warned the cabin crew that they were about to enter an area of turbulence. Probably two to three minutes after this the aircraft encountered icing conditions the cockpit voice recorder recorded what sounded like hail or grapple on the outside of the aircraft, and the engine anti-ice system came on and ice crystals started to accumulate in the pitot tubes pitot tubes measure how fast the aircraft is moving through the air. Bonin turned the aircraft slightly to the left and decreased its speed from Mach 0.82 to Mach 0.8 the recommended 
Turbulence penetration speed At 2 hours 10 minutes and 5 seconds coordinated universal time the autopilot disengaged because the blocked pitot tubes were no longer providing valid airspeed information, and the aircraft transitioned from normal law to alternate law 2. The engine's auto thrust systems disengaged 3 seconds later. As pilot flying, Bonin took control of the aircraft via the side stick priority button and said, I have the controls. Without the autopilot, the aircraft started to roll to the right due to turbulence, and Bonin reacted by deflecting his side stick to the left. One consequence of the change to alternate law was an increase in the aircraft's sensitivity to roll, and the pilot's input overcorrected for the initial upset. During the next 30 seconds, the aircraft rolled alternately left and right as Bonin adjusted to the altered handling characteristics of his aircraft. At the same time he abruptly pulled back on his side stick, raising the nose. This action was unnecessary and excessive under the circumstances. The aircraft's stall warning sounded briefly twice due to the angle of attack tolerance being exceeded, and the aircraft's recorded airspeed dropped sharply from 274 knots 507 km per hour, 315 miles per hour, to 52 knots 96 km per hour, 60 miles per hour. The aircraft's angle of attack increased, and the aircraft started to climb above its cruising level of FL-350. By the time the pilot had control of the aircraft's roll, it was climbing at nearly 7,000 feet per minute 36 meters per second for comparison, typical normal rate of climb for modern airliners is only 2,000 to 3,000 feet per minute 10 to 15 meters per second at sea level, and much smaller at high altitude. At 2 hours 10 minutes and 34 seconds coordinated universal time, after displaying incorrectly for half a minute, the left side instruments recorded a sharp rise in airspeed to 223 knots 413 km per hour, 257 miles per hour, as did the integrated standby instrument system ISIS. 33 seconds later, the right side instruments are not recorded by the recorder. The icing event had lasted for just over a minute. The pilot continued making nose-up inputs. The trimmable horizontal stabilizer THS moved from 3 to 13 degrees nose-up in about one minute, and remained in that latter position until the end of the flight. At 2 hours 11 minutes and 10 seconds coordinated universal time, the aircraft had climbed to its maximum altitude of around 38,000 feet 12,000 meters. There, its angle of attack was 16 degrees, and the engine thrust levers were in the fully forward takeoff, go around detent toga. As the aircraft began to descend, the angle of attack rapidly increased toward 30 degrees. A second consequence of the reconfiguration into alternate law was that stall protection no longer operated. Whereas in normal law, the aircraft's flight management computers would have acted to prevent such a high angle of attack, in alternate law this did not happen. Indeed, the switch into alternate law occurred precisely because the computers, denied reliable speed data, were no longer able to provide such protection, nor many of the other functions expected of normal law. The wings lost lift and the aircraft stalled. In response to the stall, First Officer Robert said, Controls to the left and took over control of the aircraft. Robert pushed his control stick forward to lower the nose and recover from the stall, however, Bonin was still pulling his control stick back. The inputs cancelled each other out and triggered a dual input warning. At 2 hours 11 minutes and 40 seconds coordinated universal time, Captain Dubois re-entered the cockpit after being summoned by First Officer Robert. Noticing the various alarms going off, he asked the two crew members, Er, what are you doing? The angle of attack had then reached 40 degrees, and the aircraft had descended to 35,000 feet 11,000 meters with the engines running at almost 100% N1, the rotational speed of the front intake fan, which delivers most of a turbofan engine's thrust. The stall warning stopped, as all airspeed indications were now considered invalid by the aircraft's computer due to the high angle of attack. The aircraft had its nose above the horizon but was descending steeply. 
Roughly 20 seconds later, at 2.12 coordinated universal time, the pilot decreased the aircraft's pitch slightly, airspeed indications became valid, and the stall warning sounded again, it then sounded intermittently for the remaining duration of the flight, but stopped when the pilot increased the aircraft's nose-up pitch. From there until the end of the flight, the angle of attack never dropped below 35 degrees. From the time the aircraft stalled until its impact with the ocean, the engines were primarily developing either 100% N1 or toga thrust, though they were briefly spooled down to about 50% N1 on two occasions. The engines always responded to commands and were developing in excess of 100% N1 when the flight ended. First Officer Robert said to himself, Climb! Four times. Bonin heard this and replied, but I've been at maximum nose up for a while. Captain Dubois realized Bonin was causing the stall, causing him to shout, No, 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 don't climb. The aircraft was now too low to recover from the stall. Shortly thereafter, the ground proximity warning system sounded an alarm, warning the crew about the aircraft's now imminent crash with the ocean. Bonin, realizing the situation, said, Fuck. We're going to crash. This can't be true. But what's happening? The last CVR recording was Captain Dubois saying, degrees pitch attitude. The flight data recording stopped at 2 hours 14 minutes and 28 seconds coordinated universal time, or 3 hours 45 minutes after takeoff. At that point, the aircraft's ground speed was 107 knots, 198 kilometers per hour, 123 miles per hour, and it was descending at 10,912 feet per minute, 55.43 meters per second, 108 knots, 200 kilometers per hour, 124 miles per hour, a vertical speed. Its pitch was 16.2 degrees, nose up, with a roll angle of 5.3 degrees left. During its descent, the aircraft had turned more than 180 degrees to the right to a compass heading of 270 degrees. The aircraft remained stalled during its entire 3-minute 30-second descent from 38,000 feet 12, meters. The aircraft crashed belly first into the ocean at a speed of 152 knots, 282 kilometers per hour, 175 miles per hour, comprising vertical and horizontal components of 108 knots, 200 kilometers per hour, 124 miles per hour, and 107 knots, 198 kilometers per hour, 123 miles per hour, respectively. All 228 passengers and crew on board died and the aeroplane was destroyed. Topic. Automated messages Air France's A330s are equipped with a communication system, Aircraft Communication Addressing and Reporting System ACARS, which enables them to transmit data messages via VHF or satellite. ACARS can be used by the aircraft's onboard computers to send messages automatically, and FGZCP transmitted a position report approximately every 10 minutes. Its final position report at 2 hours 10 minutes and 34 seconds gave the aircraft's coordinates as 2 degrees 59 and 30 degrees 35 W. In addition to the routine position reports, FGZCP's centralized maintenance system sent a series of messages via ACARS in the minutes immediately prior to its disappearance. These messages, sent to prepare maintenance workers on the ground prior to arrival, were transmitted between 2.10 Coordinated Universal Time and 2.15 Coordinated Universal Time, and consisted of five failure reports and 19 warnings. Until the black box flight recorders were recovered two years later, these messages represented the only recorded data available to the investigators. While they offered insights into the nature of the incident, with these alone a full accounting of what had happened to Flight 447 remained elusive. Among the ACARS transmissions at 2.10 is one message that indicates a fault in the Pitot static system. Bruno Sonati, president of Alter, Air France's third biggest pilots' union, stated that piloting becomes very difficult, near impossible, without reliable speed data. 
The 12 warning messages with the same time code indicate that the autopilot and auto thrust system had disengaged, that the TCAS was in fault mode, and flight mode went from normal law to alternate law. The remainder of the messages occurred from 2.11 Coordinated Universal Time to 2.14 Coordinated Universal Time, containing a fault message for an air data inertial reference unit ADIRU, and the integrated standby instrument system ISIS. At 2.12 Coordinated Universal Time, a warning message NAV ADR disagree indicated that there was a disagreement between the three independent air data systems. At 2.13 Coordinated Universal Time, a fault message for the flight management guidance and envelope computer was sent. One of the two final messages transmitted at 2.14 Coordinated Universal Time was a warning referring to the air data reference system, the other advisory was a cabin vertical speed warning indicating that the aircraft was descending at a high rate. Topic. Weather conditions Weather conditions in the Mid-Atlantic were normal for the time of year, and included a broad band of thunderstorms along the Intertropical Convergence Zone ITCZ. A meteorological analysis of the area surrounding the flight path showed a mesoscale convective system extending to an altitude of around 50,000 feet 15, meters above the Atlantic Ocean before Flight 447 disappeared. During its final hour, Flight 447 encountered areas of light turbulence. Commercial air transport crews routinely encounter this type of storm in this area. With the aircraft under the control of its automated systems, one of the main tasks occupying the cockpit crew was that of monitoring the progress of the flight through the ITCZ, using the onboard weather radar to avoid areas of significant turbulence. Twelve other flights had recently shared more or less the same route that Flight 447 was using at the time of the accident. Topic. Search and recovery. Topic. Surface search Flight 447 was due to pass from Brazilian airspace into Senegalese airspace at approximately 2.20 UTC on 1 June, and then into Cape Verdean airspace at approximately 3.45. Shortly after 4 o'clock, when the flight had failed to contact air traffic control in either Senegal or Cape Verde, the controller in Senegal attempted to contact the aircraft. When he received no response, he asked the crew of another Air France flight AF-459 to try to contact AF-447. This also met with no success. After further attempts to contact Flight 447 were unsuccessful, an aerial search for the missing Airbus commenced from both sides of the Atlantic. Brazilian Air Force aircraft from the archipelago of Fernando de Noronha and French reconnaissance aircraft based in Dakar, Senegal led the search. They were assisted by a CASA 235 maritime patrol aircraft from Spain and a United States Navy Lockheed Martin P-3 Orion anti-submarine warfare and maritime patrol aircraft. By early afternoon on 1 June, officials with Air France and the French government had already presumed the aircraft had been lost with no survivors. An Air France spokesperson told L'Express that there was no hope for survivors. And French President Nicolas Sarkozy announced there was almost no chance anyone survived. On 2 June at 1520 UTC, a Brazilian Air Force Embraer R99A spotted wreckage and signs of oil, possibly jet fuel, strewn along a 5 km three miles band 650 km 400 miles northeast of Fernando de Noronha Island, near the St. Peter and St. Paul archipelago. The sighted wreckage included an aircraft seat, an orange buoy, a barrel, and white pieces and electrical conductors. Later that day, after meeting with relatives of the Brazilians on the aircraft, Brazilian Defense Minister Nelson Jobim announced that the Air Force believed the wreckage was from Flight 447. Brazilian Vice President José Alencar, acting as president since Luis Inácio Lula da Silva was out of the country, declared three days of official mourning. Also on 2 June, two French Navy vessels, the frigate Ventos and helicopter carrier Mistral, were en route to the suspected crash site. 
Other ships sent to the site included the French research vessel Porcoy Pa, equipped with two mini submarines able to descend to 6,000 meters (20,000 feet). Since the area of the Atlantic in which the aircraft went down was thought to be as deep as 4,700 meters (15,400 feet), on the 3rd of June, the first Brazilian Navy, the Marina do Brasil or MB ship, the patrol boat Grajau, reached the area in which the first debris was spotted. The Brazilian Navy sent a total of five ships to the debris site. The frigate Constituição and the corvette Caboco were scheduled to reach the area on the 4th of June. The frigate Bocicio on the 6th of June and the replenishment oiler Almirante Gastão Mata on the 7th of June. Early on the 6th of June 2009, five days after Flight 447 disappeared, two male bodies, the first to be recovered from the crashed aircraft, were brought on board the Caboco along with a seat, a nylon bag backpack containing a computer and vaccination card, and a leather briefcase containing a boarding pass for the Air France flight. At this point, and with this evidence, investigators confirmed the plane had crashed killing everyone on board. The following day, 7 June, search crews recovered the Airbus's vertical stabilizer, the first major piece of wreckage to be discovered. Pictures of this part being lifted onto the Constituição became a poignant symbol of the loss of the Air France craft. The search and recovery effort reached its peak over the next week or so, as the number of personnel mobilized by the Brazilian military exceeded 1,100. Fifteen aircraft, including two helicopters, were devoted to the search mission. The Brazilian Air Force Embraer R-99 flew for more than 100 hours, and electronically scanned more than a million square kilometers of ocean. Other aircraft involved in the search scanned, visually, 320,000 square kilometers of ocean and were used to direct Navy vessels involved in the recovery effort. By 16 June 2009, 50 bodies had been recovered from a wide area of the ocean. They were transported to shore, first by the frigates Constituição and Bocicio to the islands of Fernando de Noronha and thereafter by air to Recife for identification. Pathologists identified all 50 bodies recovered from the crash site, including that of the captain, by using dental records and fingerprints. The search teams logged the time and location of every find in a database which, by the time the search ended on 26 June, catalogued 640 items of debris from the aircraft. The B documented the timeline of discoveries in its first interim report. <laughs> <laughs> Underwater search On 5 June 2009, the French nuclear submarine Emeraud was dispatched to the crash zone, arriving in the area on the 10th. Its mission was to assist in the search for the missing flight recorders or black boxes that might be located at great depth. The submarine would use its sonar to listen for the ultrasonic signal emitted by the black boxes, pingers, covering 13 square miles 34 square kilometers a day. The Emerald was to work with the mini-sub Nautil, which can descend to the ocean floor. The French submarines would be aided by two U.S. underwater audio devices capable of picking up signals at a depth of 20,000 feet 6, meters. .Following the end of the search for bodies, the search continued for the Airbus's black boxes. The cockpit voice recorder CVR, and the flight data recorder FDR. French Bureau d'Enquêtes et d'Analyses B Chief Paul Louis Arslanian said that he was not optimistic about finding them since they might have been under as much as 3,000 meters 9,800 feet of water, and the terrain under this portion of the ocean was very rugged. Investigators were hoping to find the aircraft's lower aft section, since that was where the recorders were located. Although France had never recovered a flight recorder from such depths, there was precedent for such an operation. In 1988, an independent contractor recovered the CVR of South African Airways Flight 295 from a depth of 4,900 meters (16,100 feet) in a search area of between 80 and 250 square nautical miles (270 and 860 square kilometers). The Air France flight recorders were fitted with water-activated acoustic underwater locator beacons or pingers, which should have remained active for at least 30 days, giving searchers that much time to locate the origin of the signals. France requested two towed pinger locator hydrophones 
from the United States Navy to help find the aircraft. The French nuclear submarine and two French contracted ships, the Fairmount Expedition and the Fairmount Glacier, towing the U.S. Navy listening devices, trawled a search area with a radius of 80 kilometers 50 miles, centered on the aircraft's last known position. By mid-July, recovery of the black boxes still had not been announced. The finite beacon battery life meant that, as the time since the crash elapsed, the likelihood of location diminished. In late July, the search for the black boxes entered its second phase, with a French research vessel resuming the search using a towed sonar array. The second phase of the search ended on 20 August without finding wreckage within a 75 kilometers 47 miles radius of the last position, as reported at 2.10. The third phase of the search for the recorders lasted from 2 April until 24 May 2010, and was conducted by two ships, the Anne Candies and the Seabed Worker. The Ann Candies towed a U.S. Navy sonar array, while the Seabed Worker operated three robot submarines AUV Abyss, a Remus AUV type. Air France and Airbus jointly funded the third phase of the search. The search covered an area of 6,300 square kilometers, 2,400 square miles, mostly to the north and northwest of the aircraft's last known position. The search area had been drawn up by oceanographers from France, Russia, Great Britain and the United States combining data on the location of floating bodies and wreckage, and currents in the mid-Atlantic in the days immediately after the crash. A smaller area to the southwest was also searched, based on a re-analysis of sonar recordings made by Emerod the previous year. The third phase of the search ended on 24 May 2010 without any success, though the B says that the search nearly covered the whole area drawn up by investigators. Topic. 2011 search and recovery In July 2010, the U.S.-based search consultancy Metron, Inc. had been engaged to draw up a probability map of where to focus the search, based on prior probabilities from flight data and local condition reports, combined with the results from the previous searches. The Metron team used what it described as classic Bayesian search methods, an approach that had previously been successful in the search for the submarine USS Scorpion and SS Central America. Phase 4 of the search operation started close to the aircraft's last known position, which was identified by the Metron study as being the most likely resting place of Flight 447. Within a week of resuming of the search operation, on 3 April 2011, a team led by the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution operating full ocean depth autonomous underwater vehicles AUVs, owned by the Waite Institute discovered, by means of side-scan sonar, a large portion of the debris field from Flight AF-447. Further debris and bodies, still trapped in the partly intact remains of the aircraft's fuselage, were at a depth of 3,980 meters 2,180 fathoms, 13,060 feet. The debris was found lying in a relatively flat and silty area of the ocean floor as opposed to the extremely mountainous topography originally believed to be AF 447's final resting place. Other items found were engines, wing parts and the landing gear. The debris field was described as quite compact, measuring 200 by 600 meters, 660 by 1970 feet and a short distance north of where pieces of wreckage had been recovered previously, suggesting the aircraft hit the water largely intact. The French Ecology and Transportation Minister Natalie Casiasco Morizet stated the bodies and wreckage would be brought to the surface and taken to France for examination and identification. The French government chartered the Ile de Seine to recover the flight recorders from the wreckage. An American Remora 6000 remotely operated vehicle, ROV, an operations crew from Phoenix International experienced in the recovery of aircraft for the United States Navy were on board the Ile de Seine. Ile de Seine arrived at the crash site on 26 April, and during its first dive, the Remora 6000 found the flight data recorder chassis, although without the crash survivable memory unit. On 1 May the memory unit was found and lifted on board the Ile de Seine by the ROV. 
The aircraft's cockpit voice recorder was found on 2 May 2011, and was raised and brought on board the Eel de Sign the following day. On 7 May the flight recorders, under judicial seal, were taken aboard the French Navy patrol boat Le Capricieuse for transfer to the port of Cayenne. From there they were transported by air to the B's office in Le Bourget near Paris for data download and analysis. One engine and the avionics bay, containing onboard computers, had also been raised. By 15 May all the data from both the flight data recorder and the cockpit voice recorder had been downloaded. The data was analyzed over the following weeks, and the findings published in the third interim report at the end of July. The entire download was filmed and recorded. Between 5 May and 3 June 2011, 104 bodies were recovered from the wreckage, bringing the total number of bodies found to 154. Fifty bodies had been previously recovered from the sea. The search ended with the remaining 74 bodies still not recovered. Topic. Investigation and safety improvements The French authorities opened two investigations. A criminal investigation for manslaughter began 5 June 2009, under the supervision of investigating magistrate Sylvie Zimmerman from the Paris Tribunal de Grande instance. The judge gave the investigation to the Gendarmerie Nationale, which would conduct it through its Aerial Transportation Division Gendarmerie des Transports Aériens or GTA and its Forensic Research Institute the Institut de Recherche Criminelle de la Gendarmerie Nationale, FR. As part of the criminal investigation, the DGSE, the External French Intelligence Agency, examined the names of passengers on board for any possible links to terrorist groups. In March 2011, a French judge filed preliminary manslaughter charges against Air France and Airbus over the crash, a technical investigation, the goal of which was to enhance the safety of future flights. In accordance with the provisions of ICAO Annex 13, the Bureau d'Enquêtes et d'Analyses pour la Sécurité de l'Aviation Civile B participated in the investigation as representative for the state country of manufacture of the Airbus. The Brazilian Air Force's Aeronautical Accidents Investigation and Prevention Center CENIPA, the German Federal Bureau of Aircraft Accident Investigation BFU, the Air Accidents Investigation Branch AAIB, and the National Transportation Safety Board NTSB also became involved in accordance with these provisions. The NTSB became involved as the state of manufacture of the general electric equipment installed in the plane, and the other representatives could supply important information. The People's Republic of China, Croatia, Hungary, Republic of Ireland, Italy, Lebanon, Morocco, Norway, South Korea, Russia, South Africa, and Switzerland appointed observers, since citizens of those countries were on board. On 5 June 2009, the B cautioned against premature speculation as to the cause of the crash. At that time, the investigation had established only two facts. The weather near the aircraft's planned route included significant convective cells typical of the equatorial regions, and the speeds measured by the three pitot tubes differed from each other during the last few minutes of the flight. On 2 July 2009, the B released an intermediate report, which described all known facts, and a summary of the visual examination of the rudder and the other parts of the aircraft that had been recovered at that time. According to the B, this examination showed the airliner was likely to have struck the surface of the sea in a normal flight attitude, with a high rate of descent. There were no signs of any fires or explosions. The airliner did not break up in flight. The report also stresses that the B had not had access to the postmortem reports at the time of its writing. On the 16th of May 2011, Le Figaro reported that the B investigators had ruled out an aircraft malfunction as the cause of the crash, according to preliminary information extracted from the flight data recorder. The following day, the B issued a press release explicitly describing the Le Figaro report as a sensationalist publication of non-validated information. The B stated that no conclusions had been made, investigations were continuing, and no interim report was expected before the summer. On 18 May the head of the investigation further stated no major malfunction of the aircraft had been found so far in the data from the flight data recorder, but that minor malfunctions had not been ruled out.
Topic: <laughs> Airspeed inconsistency. In the minutes before its disappearance, the aircraft's onboard system sent a number of messages, via the Aircraft Communications Addressing and Reporting System ACARS, indicating disagreement in the indicated airspeed IAS readings. A spokesperson for the B claimed, The airspeed of the aircraft was unclear. To the pilots and, on 4 June 2009, Airbus issued an accident information telex to operators of all its aircraft reminding pilots of the recommended abnormal and emergency procedures to be taken in the case of unreliable airspeed indication. French Transport Minister Dominique Bussereau said. Obviously the pilots of flight 447 did not have the correct speed showing, which can lead to two bad consequences for the life of the aircraft, under speed, which can lead to a stall, and over speed, which can lead to the aircraft breaking up because it is approaching the speed of sound and the structure of the plane is not made for enduring such speeds. Topic. Pitot tubes Between May 2008 and March 2009, nine incidents involving the temporary loss of airspeed indication appeared in the Air Safety Reports for Air France's A330, A340 fleet. All occurred in crews between flight levels FL310 and FL380. Further, after the Flight 447 accident, Air France identified six additional incidents which had not been reported on ASRs. These were intended for maintenance aircraft technical logs ATLs, drawn up by the pilots to describe these incidents only partially, to indicate the characteristic symptoms of the incidents associated with unreliable airspeed readings. The problems primarily occurred in 2007 on the A320 but, awaiting a recommendation from Airbus, Air France delayed installing new pitot tubes on A330, A340 and increased inspection frequencies in these aircraft. When it was introduced in 1994, the Airbus A330 was equipped with pitot tubes, part number 0851GR, manufactured by Goodrich Sensors and Integrated Systems. A 2001 Airworthiness Directive required these to be replaced with either a later Goodrich design, part number 0851HL, or with pitot tubes made by Thales, part number C16195AA. Air France chose to equip its fleet with the Thales pitot tubes. In September 2007, Airbus recommended that Thales C16195AA pitot tubes should be replaced by Thales model C16195BA to address the problem of water ingress that had been observed. Since it was not an airworthiness directive, the guidelines allow the operator to apply the recommendations at its discretion. Air France implemented the change on its A320 fleet where the incidents of water ingress were observed and decided to do so in its A330, 340 fleet only when failures started to occur in May 2008. After discussing these issues with the manufacturer, Air France sought a means of reducing these incidents, and Airbus indicated that the new pitot probe designed for the A320 was not designed to prevent cruise level ice over. In 2009, tests suggested that the new probe could improve its reliability, prompting Air France to accelerate the replacement program, which started on 29 May. FGZCP was scheduled to have its pitot tubes replaced as soon as it returned to Paris. By 17 June 2009, Air France had replaced all pitot probes on its A330 type aircraft. In July 2009, Airbus issued new advice to A330 and A340 operators to exchange Thales pitot tubes for tubes from Goodrich. On 12 August 2009, Airbus issued three mandatory service bulletins, requiring that all A330 and A340 aircraft be fitted with two Goodrich 0851HL pitot tubes and one Thales model C16195BA pitot or, alternatively, three of the Goodrich pitot tubes, Thales model C16195AA pitot tubes were no longer to be used. This requirement was incorporated into airworthiness directives issued by the European Aviation Safety Agency EASA on 31 August and by the Federal Aviation Administration FAA on 3 September. The replacement was to be completed by 7 January 2010. 
According to the FAA, in its Federal Register publication, use of the Thales model has resulted in reports of airspeed indication discrepancies while flying at high altitudes in inclement weather conditions that could result in reduced control of the airplane. The FAA further stated that the Thales model probe has not yet demonstrated the same level of robustness to withstand high-altitude ice crystals as Goodrich Pitot probes PN0851HL. On 20 December 2010, Airbus issued a warning to roughly 100 operators of A330, A340-200 and A340-300 aircraft regarding pitot tubes, advising pilots not to re-engage the autopilot following failure of the airspeed indicators. Safety recommendations issued by B for pitot probes design, recommended that they must be fitted with a heating system designed to prevent any malfunctioning due to icing. Appropriate means must be provided visual warning directly visible to the crew to inform the crew of any non-functioning of the heating system. Topic. Findings from the flight data recorder On 27 May 2011, the B released an update on its investigation describing the history of the flight as recorded by the flight data recorder. This confirmed what had previously been concluded from post-mortem examination of the bodies and debris recovered from the ocean surface, the aircraft had not broken up at altitude but had fallen into the ocean intact. The flight recorders also revealed that the aircraft's descent into the sea was not due to mechanical failure or the aircraft being overwhelmed by the weather, but because the flight crew had raised the aircraft's nose, reducing its speed until it entered an aerodynamic stall. While the inconsistent airspeed data caused the disengagement of the autopilot, the reason the pilots lost control of the aircraft remains something of a mystery, in particular because pilots would normally try to lower the nose in the event of a stall. Multiple sensors provide the pitch attitude information and there was no indication that any of them were malfunctioning. One factor may be that since the A330 does not normally accept control inputs that would cause a stall, the pilots were unaware that a stall could happen when the aircraft switched to an alternate mode due to failure of the airspeed indication. In October 2011, a transcript of the voice recorder was leaked and published in the book Errors de Pilotage. Pilot Errors by Jean-Pierre Otelli. The B and Air France both condemned the release of this information, with Air France calling it sensationalized and unverifiable information that impairs the memory of the crew and passengers who lost their lives. The B would subsequently release its final report on the accident, and Appendix 1 contained an official cockpit voice recorder transcript that did not include groups of words deemed to have no bearing on flight. Topic. Third interim report On 29 July 2011, the B released a third interim report on safety issues it found in the wake of the crash. It was accompanied by two shorter documents summarizing the interim report and addressing safety recommendations. The third interim report stated that some new facts had been established. In particular, the pilots had not applied the unreliable airspeed procedure. The pilot in control pulled back on the stick, thus increasing the angle of attack and causing the aircraft to climb rapidly. The pilots apparently did not notice that the aircraft had reached its maximum permissible altitude. The pilots did not read out the available data, vertical velocity, altitude, etc. The stall warning sounded continuously for 54 seconds. The pilots did not comment on the stall warnings and apparently did not realize that the aircraft was stalled. There was some buffeting associated with the stall. The stall warning deactivates by design when the angle of attack measurements are considered invalid, and this is the case when the airspeed drops below a certain limit. In consequence, the stall warning came on whenever the pilot pushed forward on the stick and then stopped when he pulled back. This happened several times during the stall and this may have confused the pilots. 
Despite the fact that they were aware that altitude was declining rapidly, the pilots were unable to determine which instruments to trust. It may have appeared to them that all values were incoherent. The B assembled a human factors working group to analyze the crew's actions and reactions during the final stages of the flight. A brief bulletin by Air France indicated that the misleading stopping and starting of the stall warning alarm, contradicting the actual state of the aircraft, greatly contributed to the crew's difficulty in analyzing the situation. Topic. Final report On 5 July 2012, the B released its final report on the accident. This confirmed the findings of the preliminary reports and provided additional details and recommendations to improve safety. According to the final report, the accident resulted from the following succession of major events. Temporary inconsistency between the measured speeds, likely as a result of the obstruction of the pitot tubes by ice crystals, causing autopilot disconnection and reconfiguration to alternate law. The crew made inappropriate control inputs that destabilized the flight path. The crew failed to follow appropriate procedure for loss of displayed airspeed information. The crew were late in identifying and correcting the deviation from the flight path. The crew lacked understanding of the approach to stall. The crew failed to recognize the aircraft had stalled and consequently did not make inputs that would have made it possible to recover from the stall. These events resulted from the following major factors in combination. Feedback mechanisms on the part of those involved made it impossible to identify and remedy the repeated non-application of the procedure for inconsistent airspeed, and to ensure that crews were trained in icing of the pitot probes and its consequences. The crew lacked practical training in manually handling the aircraft both at high altitude and in the event of anomalies of speed indication. The two co-pilots' task sharing was weakened both by incomprehension of the situation at the time of autopilot disconnection, and by poor management of the startle effect, leaving them in an emotionally charged situation. The cockpit lacked a clear display of the inconsistencies in airspeed readings identified by the flight computers. The crew did not respond to the stall warning, whether due to a failure to identify the oral warning, to the transience of the stall warnings that could have been considered spurious, to the absence of any visual information that could confirm that the aircraft was approaching stall after losing the characteristic speeds, to confusing stall-related buffet for overspeed-related buffet, to the indications by the flight director that might have confirmed the crew's mistaken view of their actions, or to difficulty in identifying and understanding the implications of the switch to alternate law, which does not protect the angle of attack. Topic. Independent analyses Before and after the publication of the final report by the B in July 2012, there were many independent analyses and expert opinions published in the media about the cause of the accident. Topic. Significance of the accident In May 2011, Will S. Hilton of the New York Times commented that the crash was easy to bend into myth because no other passenger jet in modern history had disappeared so completely without a mayday call or a witness or even a trace on radar. Hilton explained that the A330 was considered to be among the safest of the passenger aircraft. Hilton added that when Flight 447 seemed to disappear from the sky, it was tempting to deliver a tidy narrative about the hubris of building a self-flying aircraft, Icarus falling from the sky. Or maybe Flight 447 was the Titanic, an uncrashable ship at the bottom of the sea. Dr. Guy Grattan, an aviation expert from the Flight Safety Laboratory at Brunel University, said, This is an air accident the likes of which we haven't seen before. Half the accident investigators in the Western world, and in Russia too, are waiting for these results. This has been the biggest investigation since Lockerbie. Put bluntly, big passenger planes do not just fall out of the sky. Topic. Angle of attack indication 
In a July 2011 article in Aviation Week, Chesley Sully Sullenberger was quoted as saying the crash was a seminal accident and suggested that pilots would be able to better handle upsets of this type if they had an indication of the wing's angle of attack Awa. By contrast, aviation author Captain Bill Palmer has expressed doubts that an angle of attack indicator would have saved AF-447, writing, As the PF seemed to be ignoring the more fundamental indicators of pitch and attitude, along with numerous stall warnings, one could question what difference a rarely used AWA gauge would have made. Following its investigation, the B recommended that EASA and the FAA should consider making it mandatory to have an angle of attack indicator on the instrument panel. In 2014, the FAA streamlined requirements for AWA indicators for general aviation without affecting requirements for commercial aviation. Topic. Human factors and computer interaction On 6 December 2011, Popular Mechanics magazine published an English translation of the analysis of the transcript of the cockpit voice recorder controversially leaked in the book Errors de Pilotage. It highlighted the role of the copilot installing the aircraft while the flight computer was under alternate law at high altitude. This simple but persistent human error was given as the most direct cause of this accident. In the commentary accompanying the article, they also noted that the failure to follow principles of crew resource management was a contributory factor. The final B report points to the human computer interface HCI of the Airbus as a possible factor contributing to the crash. It provides an explanation for most of the pitch-up inputs by the pilot flying PF, left unexplained in the popular mechanics piece, namely that the flight director FD display was misleading. The pitch-up input at the beginning of the fatal sequence of events appears to be the consequence of an altimeter error. The investigators also pointed to the lack of a clear display of the airspeed inconsistencies even though the computers had identified them. Some systems generated failure messages only about the consequences but never mentioned the origin of the problem. The investigators recommended a blocked pitot tube should be clearly indicated as such to the crew on the flight displays. The Daily Telegraph pointed out the absence of angle of attack information, which is so important in identifying and preventing a stall. The paper stated that, Though angle of attack readings are sent to onboard computers, there are no displays in modern jets to convey this critical information to the crews. Der Spiegel indicated the difficulty the pilots faced in diagnosing the problem. One alarm after another lit up the cockpit monitors. One after another, the autopilot, the automatic engine control system, and the flight computers shut themselves off. Against this backdrop of confusing information, difficulty with oral cognition due to heavy buffeting from the storm as well as the stall and zero external visibility, the pilots had less than three minutes to identify the problem and take corrective action. The Spiegel report asserts that such a crash could happen again. In an article in Vanity Fair, William Langwish noted that once the angle of attack was so extreme, the system rejected the data as invalid and temporarily stopped the stall warnings. However, this led to a perverse reversal that lasted nearly to the impact, each time Bonin happened to lower the nose, rendering the angle of attack marginally less severe, the stall warning sounded again, a negative reinforcement that may have locked him into his pattern of pitching up which increased the angle of attack and thus prevented the aircraft from getting out of its stall. Topic. Side stick control issue In April 2012 in the Daily Telegraph, British journalist Nick Ross published a comparison of Airbus and Boeing flight controls. Unlike the control yoke used on Boeing flight decks, the Airbus side stick controls give little visual feedback and no sensory or tactile feedback to the second pilot. Ross reasoned that this might in part explain why the pilot flying's fatal nose-up inputs were not countermanded by his two colleagues. In a July 2012 CBS report, Sullenberger suggested the design of the Airbus cockpit might have been a factor in the accident. 
The flight controls are not mechanically linked between the two pilot seats, and Robert, the left seat pilot who believed he had taken over control of the aircraft, was not aware that Bonin continued to hold the stick back, which overrode Robert's own control. Topic. Fatigue Getting enough sleep is a constant challenge for pilots of long-haul flights. Although the bee could find no objective indications that the pilots of Flight 447 were suffering from fatigue, some exchanges recorded on the cockpit voice recorder CVR, including a remark made by Captain Dubois that he had only slept an hour, could indicate the crew were not well rested before the flight. The co-pilots had spent three nights in Rio de Janeiro. Topic. Aftermath Shortly after the crash, Air France changed the number of the regular Rio de Janeiro Paris flight from AF-447 to AF-445. The route still uses Airbus A330-200. Six months later, on the 30th of November 2009, Air France Flight 445, operated by another Airbus A330-203, registered FGZCK, made a mayday call because of severe turbulence around the same area and at a similar time to when Flight 447 had crashed. Because the pilots could not obtain immediate permission from air traffic controllers to descend to a less turbulent altitude, the mayday was to alert other aircraft in the vicinity that the flight had deviated from its normal flight level. This is standard contingency procedure when changing altitude without direct ATC authorization. After 30 minutes of moderate to severe turbulence, the flight continued normally. The flight landed safely in Paris six hours and 40 minutes after the mayday call. Topic. Inaccurate airspeed indicators There have been several cases where inaccurate airspeed information led to flight incidents on the A330 and A340. Two of those incidents involved pitot probes. In the first incident, an Air France A340-300 FGLZL, en route from Tokyo to Paris experienced an event at 31,000 feet 9,400 meters, in which the airspeed was incorrectly reported and the autopilot automatically disengaged. Bad weather, together with obstructed drainage holes in all three pitot probes, were subsequently found to be the cause. In the second incident, an Air France A340-300 FGLZN, en route from Paris to New York, encountered turbulence followed by the autoflight systems going offline, warnings over the accuracy of the reported airspeed and two minutes of stall alerts. Another incident on TAM Flight 8091, from Miami to Rio de Janeiro on 21 May 2009, involving an A330-200, showed a sudden drop of outside air temperature, then loss of air data, the ADIRS, autopilot and autothrust. The aircraft descended 1,000 meters 3,300 feet before being manually recovered using backup instruments. The NTSB also examined a similar 23 June 2009 incident on a Northwest Airlines flight from Hong Kong to Tokyo, concluding in both cases that the aircraft operating manual was sufficient to prevent a dangerous situation from occurring. Following the crash of Air France 447, other Airbus A330 operators studied their internal flight records to seek patterns. Delta Air Lines analyzed the data of Northwest Airlines flights that occurred before the two companies merged and found a dozen incidents in which at least one of an A330's pitot tubes had briefly stopped working when the aircraft was flying through the intertropical convergence zone, the same location where Air France 447 crashed. Topic. In popular culture A one-hour documentary entitled Lost, The Mystery of Flight 447 detailing an early independent hypothesis about the crash was produced by Darlow Smithson in 2010 for Nova and the BBC.
Using the then sparse publicly available evidence and information, and without data from the black boxes, a critical chain of events was postulated, employing the expertise of an expert pilot, an expert accident investigator, an aviation meteorologist, and an aircraft structural engineer. On 16 September 2012, Channel 4 UK presented Fatal Flight 447, Chaos in the Cockpit, which showed data from the black boxes including an in-depth reenactment. It was produced by Minnow Films. The aviation disaster documentary television series Mayday, also known as Air Crash Investigation and Air Emergency, produced an hour-long episode titled Air France 447, Vanished, which aired on 15 April 2013 in Great Britain and 17 May 2013 in the U.S. An article about the crash by American author and pilot William Langwish, entitled should airplanes be flying themselves? Was published by Vanity Fair in October 2014, a 99% invisible podcast episode about the flight, entitled Children of the Magenta Automation Paradox, PT. 1. Was released on the 23rd of June 2015 as the first of a two-part story about automation. In November 2015, MIT professor David Mindel discussed the Air France Flight 447 tragedy in the opening segment of an EconTalk podcast dedicated to the ideas in Mindel's 2015 book Our Robots, Ourselves, Robotics, and the Myths of Autonomy. Mindel said the crash illustrated a failed handoff. With insufficient warning, from the aircraft's autopilot to the human pilots, Charles Duhigg writes about Flight 447 extensively in his book Smarter Faster Better, particularly about the errors the pilots made due to cognitive tunneling. Topic. See also List of aircraft accidents and incidents resulting in at least 50 fatalities Air France accidents and incidents. Topic Notes Topic Works cited Official sources in English B. France, the 2nd of July 2009, interim report on the accident on the 1st of June 2009 to the Airbus A330-203 registered FGZCP operated by Air France flight AF447 Rio de Janeiro, Paris, PDF, translated by B from French, Le Bourget, B Bureau d'Enquêtes et d'Analyses pour la Sécurité de l'Aviation Civile, ISBN 9782110988 8704 4 OCLC 821207217 archived PDF from the original on the 3rd of May 2011 retrieved the 13th of March 2017 CS1 maint ignored ISBN errors link B France the 30th of November 2009 interim report N degree 2 on the accident on the 1st of June 2009 to the Airbus A330-203 registered FGZCP operated by Air France flight AF447 Rio de Janeiro Paris PDF translated by B from French Le Bourget B Bureau d'Enquêtes et d'Analyses pour la Sécurité de l'Aviation Civile ISBN 9782-1 1109871500 OCLC 8272738411 archived PDF from the original on the 3rd of May 2011 retrieved the 12th of March 2017 B. France, the 29th of July 2011, interim report N degree 3 on the accident on the 1st of June 2009 to the Airbus A330-203 registered FGZCP operated by Air France flight AF447 Rio de Janeiro, Paris. PDF, translated by B from French, Le Bourget, B Bureau d'Enquêtes et d'Analyses pour la Sécurité de l'Aviation Civile, OCLC 827738487, archived PDF from the original on 19 September 2011, retrieved 12 March 2017.
B. France, July 2012, final report on the accident on 1 June 2009 to the Airbus A330-203 registered FGZCP operated by Air France Flight AF447 Rio de Janeiro, Paris, PDF, translated by B from French, La Bourguette, B Bureau d'Enquites et d'Analyses pour la Sécurité de l'Aviation Civile, archived, PDF, from the original on the 11th of July 2012, Retrieved the 12th of March 2017. B. France, July 2012. Appendix 2 FDR chronology. PDF. Final report on the accident on the 1st of June 2009 to the Airbus A330-203 registered FGZCP operated by Air France Flight AF447 Rio de Janeiro, Paris. PDF. Translated by B from French, La Bourguette, B Bureau d'Enquites et d'Analyses pour la Sécurité de l'Aviation Civile, archived PDF from the original on 21 September 2013, retrieved 12 March 2017 official sources in French. B. France, the 2nd of July 2009, accident survenu le 1 er juin 2009 à l'Airbus A330-203 immatriculé FGZCP exploité par Air France volume AF447 Rio de Janeiro Paris FCP 090601E, report daytape, interim report on the accident on the 1st of June 2009 to the Airbus A330-203 registered FGZCP operated by Air France Flight AF447 Rio de Janeiro, Paris, PDF, in French, La Bourguette, B Bureau d'Enquites et d'Analyses pour la Sécurité de l'Aviation Civile, ISBN 978-2-11-098702-0, OCLC 816349880, archived, PDF, from the original on 31 May 2011, retrieved 13 March March 2017 B. France, the 30th of November 2009, accident survenu le 1 er juin 2009 à l'avion Airbus A330-203 immatriculé FGZCP exploité par Air France volume AF447 Rio de Janeiro Paris, report daytape N degree 2, interim report N degree 2 on the accident on the 1st of June 2009 to the Airbus A330-203 registered FGZCP operated by Air France Flight AF447 Rio de Janeiro, Paris, PDF, in French, La Bourguette, B Bureau d'Enquites et d'Analyses pour la Sécurité de l'Aviation Civile, ISBN 978-2-11-098713-6, OCLC 762531678, archived, PDF, from the original on 31 May 2011, retrieved the 13th of March 2017 B. France, the 29th of July 2011, accident survenu le 1 er juin 2009 à l'avion Airbus A330-203 immatriculé FGZCP exploité par Air France volume AF447 Rio de Janeiro Paris, report daytape N degree 3, interim report N degree 3 on the accident on the 1st of June 2009 to the Airbus A330-203 registered FGZCP operated by Air France Flight AF447 Rio de Janeiro, Paris, PDF, in French, La Bourguette, B Bureau d'Enquites et d'Analyses pour la Sécurité de l'Aviation Civile, archived, PDF, from the original on 14 August 2011, retrieved 13 March 2017. B. France, July 2012, accident survenu le 1 er juin 2009 à l'Airbus A330-203 immatriculé FGZCP exploité par Air France volume AF447 Rio de Janeiro, Paris report final final report on the accident on 1 June 2009 to the Airbus A330-203 registered FGZCP operated by Air France flight AF447 Rio Rio de Janeiro, Paris, PDF, in French, La Bourguette, B Bureau d'Enquites et d'Analyses pour la Sécurité de l'Aviation Civile, archived, PDF, from the original on the 11th of July 2012, retrieved the 12th of March 2017. Other sources: Otelli, Jean Pierre, the 13th of October 2011.
Errors de pilotage, Tome 5, Pilot Error, Volume 5, in French. Lavalois Perret, Altipress. ISBN 979-10-90465-03-9. OCLC 780308849. Roger Rapoport, 2011. The Rio, Paris Crash, Air France 447. Lexographic Press. ISBN 978-0-9847142-0-9. Palmer, Bill, the 20th of September 2013. Understanding Air France 447, paperback. William Palmer. ISBN 9780989785381. Palmer, Bill, 2013. 